we're going to have a look uh, at an introduction to, uh, to Neo4j's query language cipher. Um, obviously, there's lots of different ways that we could we could do that intro. This particular one is focused is makes the assumption that you have some knowledge of doing SQL. So we're going to do a bit of a comparison between the the two, uh, and we'll see how we go about solving a problem uh, using both side by side. So hopefully, you'll be familiar with the SQL way of doing things, and maybe there'll be some things you, you pick up from the, the Cypher uh, version. This is going to be the structure of what we'll do. So we'll be going through a, a data set, um, which is to, uh, like a raw data set, not in either of the formats, um, and we'll be modeling it. Uh, then we'll, we'll obviously do some, some importing of the data. Uh, we'll be writing queries on the data. We'll, we'll obviously, along the way, check the integrity of the data and check that uh, everything looks how we expect it to and we haven't uh, made any mistakes while doing our import or, or modeling it. Uh, and we'll look at how you would go about evolving the data set, so or migrating or refactoring it. Uh, okay, so let's get started. So we'll, we'll start by having a quick look at what, what is the data set that we're going to use. Um, and so uh, for this talk, we're going to use um, a data set from a website called Transfer Market. Uh, so this is uh, Football, if you're, if you're European, or I guess soccer, if you're uh, uh, in the US. Um, uh, but you don't need to uh, have any particular knowledge of that sport to understand what's going on here. Uh, effectively, uh, the domain is uh, covers uh, football players who are being transferred between different clubs. So, uh, if a player, if, if one team wants to buy another player, they have to pay a certain amount of money. Uh, and you can see from some of the other columns, it happens in a particular season. The player goes from one team to another team. Uh, and they have a nationality, and then there's a fee involved in that transfer. Uh, and then there's some other metadata on the player as well. Uh, and so it's quite easy to get the data from this website, and we can download it in uh, a CSV or very, a very tabular format. Uh, so this is like, imagine this is like a very, very wide table. So it, it covers, uh, we can get the season, we can get a lot of player information, uh, including quite helpfully a player URI, which allows us to uh, uniquely identify each player. Uh, we can then get the selling club, so that's the team that originally owned the player and has now sold them. So we've got uh, a few fields uh, detailing uh, or containing details about about that team, that club. Uh, we've then got the buying club, um, so that's similar, but they're the ones who are actually purchasing the player. Um, and then we've got details about the transfer. Um, so we have uh, again a unique identifier for the transfer. We've got uh, a transfer fee, so that's the amount of money they paid. Uh, and then uh, the, the last column is a transfer rank. So that's uh, how, what position was this transfer in the particular transfer window when it happened. So if you have a transfer rank of one, that would mean this was the most expensive transfer uh, in that window. Uh, okay, so that's the, that's the domain that we're going to work with. Um, so obviously the first thing we need to do is figure out, well, how are we going to, uh, how are we going to store this data? What is our model going to look like? Uh, so we'll start with relational. Um, and I've just picked what seemed like the most obvious uh, way of modeling something to me, uh, but I'm sure there are other ways of doing it. So if you if you uh, if you can think of a, a different or a better way, then obviously you can uh, you can let us know afterwards, and, and maybe we can uh, we can update it. Uh, but from the left hand side, we've got uh, we've got a players table, um, and we've got uh, some three fields on this. We've got an ID, we've got a name and a position, and then that one's connected uh, or has has a primary key, foreign key link into the transfers table on the player ID field. Uh, and that transfers table stores the information about the transfer of a player. Uh, and then we've got uh, two uh, foreign key, primary key uh, relationships uh, into the clubs table, which is on the right hand side. And so one is for the from club and one is from the to club, as indicated by the, by the column names here. Uh, okay, so that's reasonably simple. So we've, got, we've got the data, we've got some players, we've got the transfers, we've got the clubs. So we've got three tables. Uh, hopefully so far, so good. This is what the graph equivalent uh, would look like um, for this model. So, uh, and we'll go through um, what would you, what are the, what's the terminology that we use here? But this is a di this is a graph. This is a diagram of what what um, this data model would look like if we put it into a graph, i.e., we put it into an FJ. Uh, so let's just quickly go through it. So the highlighted in red, uh, we've got what we call nodes, and those. Uh, are equivalent to the records or the rows uh, from that uh, from that SQL um, uh, table version. 
Uh, and those are used to represent, yeah, they're representing the data or the entities uh, in our domain. So we've got uh, a node representing a player, we've got nodes representing clubs, and then we've got nodes representing transfers. We've then got, now highlighted, we've got the relationships. So those uh, are like kind of gluing our bits of data together. Uh, and one, one thing that's different here between a relational database and a graph database is that these, uh, these relationships are actually representing the join rather than uh, rather than a, a primary key foreign key relationship. So then effectively, in a relational database, we work out that join when we run the query, uh, and in a graph database, we're actually storing that when we uh, when we create the data. Uh, and you can see we also we're also able to name them. So for example, we've got from a transfer to a player, the relationship is called off player, uh, whereas from the transfer to the club, we've got a different relationship. It's called from club. Uh, so those are two things. We've got nodes and relationships. Uh, the next thing is uh, we've got properties. So these are these are these are key value pairs that we can put on um, on nodes or on relationships. Uh, and they're used to represent metadata or attributes that those nodes might have. Uh, and it might be the case that at some point what started off uh, as a property becomes a node. So we'll see an example of that uh, as, we, uh, as we go through the talk. And then finally, so that's the reason we've got nodes, we've got uh, relationships, we've got properties, and then uh, our last bit of terminology is uh, that we've got labels. So these are the, these are now highlighted in red. Uh, and they're reasonably similar to tab uh, the table names or relation names, uh, and they're used to group the nodes. Or what well, is equivalent would be group the group the rows. Uh, and so we're saying this node is of uh, label or of type or of category, whichever whichever word you prefer, uh, player, transfer, or or club. Uh, we use those. Um, in our query, so we can say, hey, I want to go look up a club with this name, or I want to go find a player who has this name in this data set. Uh, okay, so that's the right. So we've got our two models now. So we've done the relational model and we've done the graph model. What do they look like if we were to do a, a comparison side by side? Uh, so this is what I quite, uh, this is a way that I quite like uh, to think about it. Um, so in the, on the left hand side we've got the relational one and we've got and the records all ten, should have the same structure. So we have the we, we set up our structure beforehand uh, and we say these are the columns that they should have and they should have this type of data in uh, and everything's supposed to be quite uniform. Um, and we have what I call soft relationships uh, between between those uh, the different rows uh, in the tables. Uh, and that's just indicating that, that actually those uh, relationships are not stored; they're actually computed later on. Uh, on the right hand side we've got our, our graph equivalent uh, and you'll notice that nodes even if they have the same type uh, don't necessarily have exactly the same structure and we'll get we'll, we'll get on to how, how would that actually happen but that, that's the idea is that just because two nodes are both players that doesn't mean they have to have exactly the same set of, of properties on them for example uh, and then the relationships in this case are actually hard relationships they're actually stored in the database and uh, the, obviously the disadvantage of that is that we've got a bit of work, so there's a bit of a, a right penalty, if you like, to, to store those relationships. Uh, but the nice thing about doing it is that when we query the data set, uh, it's very, very quick. We don't have to go and commute, compute anything. So there's all, there, those joins are already computed for us. Uh, okay, so right, so we've got our models, and we have, probably have, hopefully, now have a rough idea of how, how these two uh, approaches compare to each other. Uh, let's have a look at how we'll, um, we'd import it. Uh, and we'll go we'll go quite slowly through the, the, the first examples, but but you'll probably get the hang of it, and it will uh, start to become a bit mundane. So we'll go a bit more quickly uh, as we go. Uh, but the first thing we would need to do uh, in our relational model is actually go and create create our schema, create the tables. So uh, here, for example, is how we might create the players table. So we might create our SQL statement, and we put it in a script, and we go and create the players table, and we set up our primary key, and we say, well, can we want a name and position field as well? So that's the players table. Uh, we might then choose, uh, we might then generate a, a SQL script um, to, to insert the uh, data into, into this table. Uh, so for example, here are the first three rows uh, of our data set uh, being loaded in. Um, and so we do insert into players, and then we list uh, the, the fields where, and where we want the data to go. Uh, we then do the same thing for the clubs. So we create the clubs table, and we create the associated fields for that. And then we'll we'll do our insert statement for the clubs. Uh, and it, it, the structure is basically is, is pretty similar. It's just the data that's going in is different. Uh, okay, so we've got the players, we've got the clubs. Uh, at the moment, we don't have any link between them, uh, but that's our next step. So we're going to create our transfers table. Uh, and this one is, is a little bit different. So this one is now, now has some, some foreign key primary key links in. So we're saying I'm referencing, so my player ID references the player's table ID, 
uh, the from club ID does a reference to the club ID and so does the to club ID. So that's effectively defining what's, what our join is going to be. Uh, and that, now we can input, import the data in. Uh, and so we, it's fairly similar to what we did on the previous uh, previous two two slides. It's, it's just that we're putting it into a different in, in different table. Uh, okay, so now, we, that, now everything's done. So that would be the end of our initial import of the data into our relational database. So we loaded, uh, we created our schema, so we created our clubs, players, and uh, transfers tables, and then we imported some data in. Now let's have a look at the graph uh, graph equivalent, and it's not it's not exactly the same uh, as the relational. So there's uh, there's some slight differences you know, to keep in mind. Um, so we're going to use what we're going to. Um, a common approach when people first start using Cypher is to actually go and generate loads of Cypher uh, statements, very similar to what we did uh, with the SQL example. But that doesn't tend to be the, the quickest way to get the data in. Uh, the quickest way to get data in, um, if it's in the CSV format, which, we, which uh, for, for us it is, uh, is to use a tool called Load CSV. Uh, this is a built-in clause into the, in the Cypher query language. Uh, and it's intended for it's, it's designed for importing CSV files, as the name indicates, and it will work uh, probably fairly well up to about 10 million records. After that, uh, there are other tools that you uh, that you might want to use. Uh, and the idea is you're you, we're kind of providing a wrapper around uh, running a sort of cipher construct to create a graph based on what's in the CSV file. Um, let's have a look uh, at how we might do that. Uh, so this is the, this is what uh, this is like the outline of a load CSV command. So um, you say load CSV with headers. So the with headers is, is an optional bit, uh, but that indicates I've got a header in my CSV file. So you're, if you if you remember back to the first couple of slides, we've got a header which says what each column means. So we need to put the with headers in, uh, and you can load a file or you can load something from HTTP uh, URI. Uh, so that's that bit. Uh, and then we say as row, and that's just saying well I want to refer to each row as this variable name. Um, so it could be line. Uh, I find row is the, the easiest word to remember. Um, once we've done that, we could then uh, this this one this one doesn't make sense when you're starting with an empty database, but we might we will then execute a, a cipher query. So we might choose to match something. Um, so um, a match means there's some data in this database. I want to go and find it. So I'm going to match uh, in this case a node. So I want to go and match a node. So find me um, find me a node. Uh, more likely, uh, I don't have any data in there, so I want to create something. So, so maybe I want to go, hey, go and create me something uh, based on. Uh, so I want to create a node that has a label. Uh, in this case, we've called it label, uh, and I want to create a property, uh, so or, or like a key, key value pair, uh, and I want to use the value that comes from row dot uh, header. In this case, that would be like that would you can use the name of one of the uh, the fields in your CSV file. Uh, or we might choose to do a merge. Now, merge is the combination of the two. So merge is, if it doesn't exist, if there's nothing there, matching uh, whatever the pattern it is that we provided, in this case, a node, uh, then create it. Uh, but if it already exists, then that's OK. Just don't do anything. That is like a, a no-op, if you like. Uh, OK, so let's have a look. Right, so what, what can we do with, with load CSV? Uh, well, apart from importing data, we can also have, use it to explore, uh, explore our data. So, so let's see. So we can have a look at what we've got. Um, so the, the transfer CSV file, I've put it into the import folder. So when you uh, install the FJ uh, at the root directory, you get an import folder. And so I can put my uh, CSV file in there. And then it allows me to refer to it without having to put any long paths in. I, it's just relative to that folder. Uh, so what we're saying here, I want to go and find transfers.csv. Uh, and just tell me how many rows are in there. So count star is, is, is doing as you might imagine. So just counting how many how many rows there are. Uh, so we've got 6,000. So we've got 6,000 transfers. Uh, and if we want to see what, what they look like, uh, and there's not going to be any surprises in this data because we've already seen it in CSV format, uh, we could change that query and say, well, actually, I want to get uh, so load that CSV. Return me a row uh, limited to, limited to one, limit, uh, i.e., give me one uh, record. Uh, and on the right-hand side, we've got a diagram showing what would uh, what would be returned. So we've got, you can see each we get back a map showing the column heading uh, and then what is in uh, that particular row. So for example, uh, on this one, we've got a buyer club. Buyer, the buyer club is AS Roma. The seller club is SL Benfica, uh, and the player is Aldeia. Uh, and you would see for each row, you would get a different map. Uh, okay, so now we're ready to import uh, some data. Um, so we might decide, okay, well, we might as well start with players. That seems to be the, 
that, that was the first one that we designed, so let's import the players. Uh, and so we might start like this. So we say, okay, I'm going to load the CSV, and I'm going to create uh, a node. So this is a node with the label. So the label here, player. So you, if you want to define, put a label on a node, you need to put a colon and then the name of the label. And I want to put uh, some properties on this. I want an ID, and I want to take the ID is going to be the player URI column from my file. I want a name. That's going to be the player name column from the file. And then uh, and position um, will be from the player position field. And that's generally, that, that, that will work fine. Uh, but one thing uh, that sometimes catches people out uh, with this is that by default, uh, there, is no, there, is no, there are no constraints. There's no schema on this, uh, on, on a near, on, in, in Near4j. So if you run this uh, query again, you'll get uh, all the players twice, which might be quite surprising if you're, if you're, if you're, if you're uh, from a SQL background. Uh, so what we actually need to do to, in, to, to stop uh, or to, 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 uh, to avoid that, that, that perhaps strange behavior that we might not have expected from happening is to, put, is to, is to actually define some schema. And, um, what we can do is we can define what we call a constraint. Um, so we consider Near4j, uh, you can probably, well, nice way to think of it is it's a schema optional database. So if you don't want any schema, you don't have to have any schema. And that's obviously uh, quite a nice thing when you're starting out and you don't really know what the shape of the data is. Uh, but once you've got uh, once you've got a reasonable idea of what your model's going to look like, you probably want to keep uh, constrain what's happening a little bit. Um, and so for this data set, uh, we know that we only want each player once. It's not very interesting to have the same player multiple times. Uh, so we want to constrain the player. Uh, and the way that we can do that is by putting a constraint on any node which has the label player. So that's that's this bit of the query. And we're saying uh, I want to make sure that the ID is unique. Uh, and so what, the, what what this does is it will um, ensure that we can't create uh, two players with the same ID. Uh, and if we then go and run that query again, to so say we run our create query um, again, uh, it will it will fail on the first player that it tries. So in, in this case, it's it's hit into a player called uh, it must be Peter Lux, and it's saying, well, you can't do that. You can't create that player because they already exist. So we've kind of clashed on the constraint. Uh, and what we might choose to do instead, uh, rather than using the create. Uh, this is my, my, my favorite way, is, is to actually use a merge statement instead. And so we can, if we use the merge, uh, and then, it, then even, if it, if it, even if it was going to violate the constraint, it will just go, oh, okay, I, well, I'm merging. So merge uh, means either I create it or I match it. And in this case, it's going to say, oh, well, okay, I matched it. So it's already there. There's already a player with that ID. Uh, so there's no need to do anything. Uh, and so when you're using the merge statement, um, you only probably in the in the actual merge. So I, I consider this to be the merge uh, bit of the command. You only need to put your primary key in there. So in our case, it's the ID that we took from Transfer Markets API. Uh, in in another data set, perhaps it's, uh, it's, a, it's the identifier that you use to represent to represent something. Uh, often, uh, I suppose it would be like an an incrementing number. Uh, so that's the merge. So we're saying I want to merge this player. So make sure they exist. Uh, if they don't already. Uh, and if I'm creating it, so the second, the third line down, on create means, uh, kind of as it says, uh, if I'm creating the player, so if I, I'm not matching it, and then I'm going to go and set some properties. So I'm going to, I'm going to put the player name and the player position. Uh, okay, so once we've done that, that will load in um, all our players. Uh, we can then do the same thing for clubs, and this time we're going to be a bit more wise because we know uh, from from our experience with the players that we don't want to create duplicates. Uh, and again, we figure out. Oh, yeah, we've got a, We've got an ID for the club as well. Um, and so we can we can run uh, a couple of queries to do this. The reason we've got two queries is because uh, we've got two different sets of clubs. So we've got selling clubs and we've got buying clubs. And we, the, the structure of this query is almost the same as the as the players one. Only thing that differs is that we're creating a different label. So we've now got a load of players on effectively a load of nodes with the player label, and we've got a load of nodes with the with the club label. Uh, now we're going to join them together, and we're going to do that by using a, a transfer node. So we're going to, again, we're probably getting a bit familiar with this by now, so we're going to create uh, a constraint on transfer ID. Uh, and now we'll, uh, we'll import the transfers. Uh, this one's a little bit more complicated than the previous two, so let's just quickly go through what's happening. So at the top of the query, we're matching some things. So match, remember, means I'm going to go and find some things that I know are in the database. Uh, in this case, uh, a player. Uh, a source club, i.e. selling club, uh, and a destination. Uh, so we get those, we kind of go, hey, go and find me the player, find me the, the, the source club, find me the destination club. 
Then we're going to create the transfer. So we'll use our merge keyword again. So we'll make sure we, we create uh, the transfer based on the ID. Uh, and we'll, if we're creating it for the first time, we'll go and put in the season, the rank, and the fee. Uh, so now we've matched. So we've found the players. We've got the source. We've got the destination. We've, we've made sure we've got a transfer. And then the last bit of the query is uh, that we're going to go and, uh, and merge it. So we're going to go and make sure these relationships exist. So the first one is there needs to be a relationship called off player with a property age going from the transfer to the player. The second uh, one is there needs to be a from club relationship from the transfer to the, to the uh, selling club. And then the final relationship is called to club, and that goes from the transfer to the destination uh, or to, to, the, uh, to, the, uh, to the destination club, to the buying club. Uh, okay, so right, so now we've, got, well, now we've finally got a graph. So before we just had nodes, uh, I suppose, floating around. So we had some set, some player nodes, and we had some club nodes, but now we've, now we've got them all together, so we've finally got a graph. Uh, let's just have a quick, uh, quick uh, look at what does schema mean. So I've touched on it a little bit. Uh, so in Neo4j, uh, as, I, as I mentioned, we've got what we consider to be an optional schema, and there are three types of schema that you can uh, uh, create at the moment. Uh, I think as time goes on, we'll get more of those, but these are the three that are, that are there at the moment. So we've got the unique uh, node property constraints, and you've seen this one already. So this is uh, we're trying to make sure that a, a property and label compare are unique. Uh, we've got the node property existence constraint. So this is the equivalent of making sure that if a property is there, it can't be null. So in this case, uh, I want to make sure if I have a, a node with the, the club label, then the name can't be null. So it has to have a name property. Uh, and we can do the same on the relationship. So we can make sure that the age property exists if you have a off player relationship. Uh, okay, so that's right. That's our, that's our uh, that's the schema over with. Uh, now let's get into some actual some actual query. So we've got the we've we started off. We had some raw data. Uh, we took it. We put it into the we put it into the two databases. We did a bit of importing. So we've done a bit of querying already. So we've seen a bit of uh, SQL importing and a bit of uh, Cipher importing. Uh, but now let's get to the to the, to the really interesting bit. Uh, now we're going to do some queries. Uh, and we'll start simple and we'll build it up. So the first one is probably is, is really is incredibly simple. Uh, find player by name. So it's a really simple one. So select star from players, uh, and uh, probably we're using our, uh, either the most famous or the second most famous uh, player in the world, uh, Cristiano Ronaldo. Uh, that, that's what it would look like if we were trying to find him, the record representing him. Uh, in Cipher, it's, it's equally simple. So we just say I want to match uh, a node. Uh, I'm going to call it player since it's just a name for the node oh, in, in, in this query. So it's just a variable name. Uh, I want to match uh, the label player, so it's the label player, uh, and the name Cristiano Ronaldo. Uh, and if we just have a quick comparison of them, so the from and where is this is equivalent uh, the, ma the match. Uh, so we the match is equivalent to the from and the where. Uh, the only thing we've done here is we've done we've put the the in cipher we could have that we could have written where player dot name equals Cristiano Ronaldo, uh, but cipher gives us a syntactic sugar that we can use instead where we can inline. Uh, equality matches. So, so we just use that just for uh, forever, uh, yeah, conciseness, I suppose, on the on the query. And then the uh, rather than uh, specifying up front which columns we want, uh, Cipher uh, um, has you specify them at the end. So in this case, we're saying I want to return uh, the player. We could have done return star, uh, but in that that is in this particular example would be identical because there aren't any other variables. Uh, okay, and if we run it, we get back, uh, as you would imagine, we get back Cristiano Ronaldo. Uh, okay, but that was, that was a reason, reasonably simple one, uh, and it only touched one table. Um, for our next query, let's have a look. At, let's get a few more of the tables involved. So we're going to try and find a transfer between some clubs. Uh, and the clubs that we're going to use are Tottenham and Manchester United. So those are, those are two, uh, two football teams um, in the UK. Uh, and what we want to do is find all the transfers that have happened where the from club was Tottenham and the to club was Manchester United. Um, so if you just have a look at the SQL version, uh, hopefully there's not anything, there's not anything that, that is too alarming there. We're just going, uh, running a query on the transfers table, joining the clubs table in so that we can get the appropriate from club and to club, uh, and then joining the player in as well so we can see well, which player was it that was transferred. So that's hopefully quite familiar. Um, this is the graph version of the same uh, query. Uh, and probably the easiest way to read this is to actually start from the where clause 
Uh, so if we go through that, so if we start here, so we're saying, okay, well, from the where clause, what are we, what are we actually trying to find? Well, we're trying to find a from uh, that has a name matching Tottenham Hotspur. Okay, so that club there is Tottenham, so we know that's going to be one node. And then the two is Manchester United. Okay, so that's the two. So we've got a two club Manchester United. So we've got Tottenham on one side. Okay, and we want to go and look for all the from transfers uh, from Tottenham to Manchester United. So that's going to get a set of, of transfers. Uh, and once we've got them, uh, we'll go and have a look which players were those between. So uh, it kind of reads roughly how you would talk about it. So I'm trying to find transfers from one, from a club. Okay, which club? Tottenham. To a club, which club? Manchester United. Uh, and then once I've got those transfers, tell me who the player uh, was. And then uh, what we're returning there is the, we're just returning the same uh, the same fields on both sides. Uh, if you want to see the, if you want to uh, compare like which bits of these query are the same as each other, those joins in the uh, SQL version are equivalent to that to our match statement. Or um, if, so for example, the club from here uh, is equivalent to to, the, to this bit of the query. The club two uh, would be this bit, and then the off player, the, the, the player join would be would be this bit. And I think it's quite SciPy has quite a nice way of, of specifying these uh, these joins. There isn't any join keyword. You're just expressing. Uh, as, so, so actually, I forgot to mention this. So this is an ASCII art representation of uh, of a query. So imagine this is like a diagram, and we're saying, well, there's like a little uh, arrow going from the transfer to a player. Uh, and there's a little arrow going from a transfer uh, to a club and then uh, to a two club and uh, to a from club as well. Uh, okay, so now we've got, now we can run the, now if we run the query, we'd get back, uh, we'd get back some, some players and it would tell us what was the transfer fee paid for that player and which season did it happen in. Um, another co a common question that people often have when, they're, when they start using NIFJ is, uh, well, how, do, how do you use indexes? So that's often a, uh, a, real, a really focal point when you're doing um, when you're doing SQL or relational database work, uh, and the, the the way that we use indexes is slightly is subtly different between the two. Um, uh, in a relational database, we're obviously taking we're taking sets of uh, well, sets of rows, sets of rows, uh, and we're trying to find the intersection of those rows. And we uh, we do that by either scanning a table to find the, the records that we're interested in, or we might be scanning uh, we're doing it like a, a a scan off a, an index, so we went like an index scan or a, a table scan, and then we'd go and join them together and we find the intersection. Uh, and so you could reasonably easily see that was what was happening in the query we just looked at. Uh, in a graph, that's, that, that's slightly different. The use of indexes is, is only to find the starting points for a query. Uh, and then after that, uh, we've got those relationships that we stored in the, in the database. So they're effectively acting, imagine, as an index. So there isn't an, a specific index, they're effectively acting as pointers that we can follow uh, between the nodes. So, there's, so for any pair of nodes that have a relationship, we've got a, like a very, very quick lookup uh, from one to the next. Um, and we can, you can actually see whether, whether and how Neo4j is using uh, its indexes uh, by uh, prefixing your query with the profile keyword, and that will show you uh, something that's very similar to what a SQL uh, profile would look like. You have the operators listed, and it shows you how the data moves between them. Uh, so in this case, um, we are. So if we go from the from the node index seek, so the the operator for an index lookup is it's called node index seek. Uh, and if we read it, we can see okay, it's using a variable called two. Uh, and if we look at our query down here on the right hand side, two is Manchester United, so it's the two club. So it's used an index to go and look up Manchester United. And then it's after that we're following the two club relationship. And if we went further down, it's a bit that this is only a partial query plan, you'd see the other parts of the query as well. Um, and and there's, a, there's a query planner that sits behind uh, behind these queries working out what it thinks is the best plan and it, it keeps um, uh, copies of those plans but will uh, refresh them from, from time to time. So there's a time to live on a plan uh, and as the, the data in our database changes it may be that, that a query gets replanned to come up with a better way of executing it. Uh, so in this case it, it, the query planner has decided the quickest way to execute this query is to start from Manchester United and then go out from there. It might be another query, it decides actually it's faster to start from Tottenham and go out from there. But for this one, uh, this is where it came up. Uh, okay, right, so, so what have we done so far? So we started with our data set, we imported the data, we, model, we, we did some modeling, um, and then we've, then we've written some, some queries against our initial model. Um, now, one thing I always used to find when I was working on uh, on projects, um, 
with relational databases was that we had uh, it was often quite painful to migrate the data, and so we'd we'd try and get the model like reason, maybe not perfect up front, but we'd often try and try and get it as close uh, to perfect as we could, so that we didn't have to to, to change it as we went. Um, and it was often quite painful because because you, you rarely were able to get it perfect first time. Um, and so one thing that I hopefully you'll see that Neo4j uh, and graphs are quite good at is evolving a model, so we don't need to get it uh, right first time. Uh, so let's but let's have a look. Let's have a look in our in our model. Uh, how would we evolve it? Um, so one thing I realised once I once I was playing with this data was that I'd missed off one of the columns. Um, so in the data set, uh, if you were if you were very eagle-eyed when we showed the data, you'll have noticed that there was a player nationality uh, column uh, in the data set, uh, and I realised that I'd completely for forgotten to put it in the data uh, and, lo and load it into the two databases. And I was like, oh no. Um, so I was a bit, a, bit, a bit annoyed with myself to begin with. I was like, oh, I know, I've missed off quite a, a bit of data that would allow us to do quite an interesting query. Uh, but it actually allows us to instead uh, demonstrate how would you, uh, what would you do to get this, uh, to get this extra column in. Uh, and it's not too hard. So this is, this is what, in a relational migration, what do we do? We're just adding a column. So we're just going to the players table, and we want to put a, a nationality on the end. Uh, okay, so it's not, it's not, it's reasonably trivial. Uh, what do we need to do? Uh, Step one, alter that table. So go and alter the table, add the column, uh, and then update each of our each of our rows to put the nationality field in. That's so far so good. Uh, graph equivalent. Uh, again, in, in, instead of adding a column, this time we're just going to put an extra property in. Uh, the difference is that we can kind of do like adding the that there isn't a separate go and alter that node to add a, uh, an extra property in. We just we just Add it in, uh, and, and, and in the process of adding, we now have this extra property on the on the uh, on the player notes. So uh, here, no TSV. I want to match because I know the player exists already because we we created it before. Uh, and this time we're gonna we're just gonna use a straight up set. So for every single player that we find, we're gonna set the nationality because we we know that it doesn't exist. Uh, okay, so that's it. So, right, so we've got the we've now got the nationality in, uh, and now we're gonna do uh, a new query. So uh, we're going to find the transfers of English players. So uh, what does that mean? Uh, so it means we're going to try and find transfers where the from club uh, was English, the to club was English, and the nationality was English. So everything, everything in the, in the query is English. Uh, we could change those to be something else, but this was just uh, quite a fun one to try. Uh, so this is what the SQL version would look like. So it's very similar to what we did before. Uh, the only thing that's changed is that we've uh, we've tweaked the where clause. So instead of looking up Tottenham and Manchester United, we're just looking up the country and the nationality. This is the cipher equivalent. Uh, so again, it's very similar. Um, and again, the where clause is where is where we've got uh, the changes from the previous uh, query, um, and it's pretty much the same. In this case, in, in SQL, we, we 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 have a where clause and we have an and to do multiple uh, where Mac, uh, where clauses. Uh, Exactly the same in Cypher. So hopefully, no, not really any surprises there. Hopefully, and if we run that, we it will come up with the, with the transfers of English players between English clubs. Uh, okay, we we, could, we couldn't do that query before because we didn't have a nationality uh, in the data. Uh, a more interesting migration or refactoring uh, that I that I thought of afterwards is to load in the countries and confederations. Um, so if you're not familiar with uh, with, with with, with those two things, I mean, I suppose the countries is, is, is reasonably self-explanatory. So each uh, club uh, is, an, is obviously represents a particular country. So for example, we have those English clubs, so Tottenham and Manchester United are both clubs in England, uh, whereas Real Madrid and Barcelona would be countries and uh, would be clubs that, that are in uh, Spain. Uh, a confederation is um, like a, I suppose like an association uh, for, in this case, they're, they're for each continent typically. So in, in Europe, we would be under the confederation called UEFA. Uh, in, the, in, in North America, you'd be under uh, CONCACAF, uh, I think is the pronunciation. Uh, and we can then uh, connect those things together. So we can kind of connect, we can load in the countries, and we can say, well, which, which confederation does each country uh, go in? And the eventual goal is, can we write some queries to see uh, how do players move between confederations, or do they, or do they stay within the same confederations? Uh, so let's do our relational migration first. So in the red uh, on this diagram are the changes that we're going to make. So we've got a few more changes this time. 
Um, so the first change is uh, on the left hand side. So where we previously had nationality, uh, we're now going to have uh, a following key link. So we're going to have a country ID. Uh, and that's going to link into a brand new table, uh, which is over here on the right hand side. So countries table. Uh, and that countries table is also going to link into clubs. So remember, clubs previously had a country, so we're going to change that as well. We're going to add a country ID on there so that we, we don't have the country uh, duplicated all over the place. Uh, and then we're going to add in our confederations table. And that's a, completely, that's a completely new one. That doesn't link into any of the other ones, only the countries, which is, which is obviously also new. Uh, and then we get a foreign key primary key relationship from the confederations to the countries as well. Uh, okay, so let's have a look. Right, so that's the that's the new uh, schema that we're we're going to try and drive our way towards. How do we do that? Uh, step one. Uh, hopefully you're quite familiar with this by now. So we're going to create the confederations table. Uh, we're going to import our confederations. There's only I think there were only seven. So this is this is quite this is going to be quite quick to do this. Uh, then we're going to create a new our second new table, our countries table. So we've got we do that. Uh, link it to the confederations table that we just created. Uh, next step, uh, put the countries in. So populate the countries. So we've got uh, a country. Uh, they all have a three-digit code. So that's the first column. Then we've got the name of the country, and then we've got which confederation they're in. Uh, okay, so that's the that's the new stuff. So we've got the new tables in and the new data loaded into those tables. Now we're going to go and tweak uh, the uh, existing things or existing tables. Uh, so we'll start with the clubs, so we're going to go and add the country uh, ID column, uh, and then we'll write this query. So this is, a, this is an update query, so this goes over the clubs table and, and, and works out <coughs> what's the country of, uh, ID that we need. Uh, and there'll be some duplication at the moment because we haven't deleted the country column yet. So we've got some duplication. So we've got, this is, this is a query of the clubs table, and we can see we've got on the right-hand side of the, of the uh, the, the view, we've got the country idea and we've got the country. Uh, and you can see that like, ITA is Italy, CGO is Congo, and, and so on. Uh, and our final step for fixing that up is well, we don't need that uh, country uh, column anymore. Uh, in an application, we might choose, uh, maybe we, 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 we choose to keep the, that duplicate data there for a little while, uh, while we uh, update our, our application, because maybe we do the database migration first, and then later on we uh, we, we move our, our application when we're happy that the migration has worked, and so we don't want to go. Obviously, we don't want to go and break our queries. Uh, so having having those two side by side might be uh, might be desirable. Uh, the next thing we're going to do, we're going to do exactly the same process, but for the players table. So if you remember, the players table had the nationality column. Um, so this time we're going to go and uh, work out what the uh, appropriate country ID is for those. Uh, and again, we get a little bit of duplication temporarily while we uh, before we remove the uh, nationality column. Uh, what does it look like if we do it in, in, in the, the graph world? So again, uh, we're, we're, the structure is almost uh, is almost the same. So we're adding in a player place for a country, a club is a part of a country, uh, and then a country is a part of a confederation. Uh, we're going to import our confederation. So hopefully this is now starting to be quite familiar. Uh, we're loading with using our load CSV command, but this time it's a different file, confederations file. And we're going to merge the confederations, i.e. we're going to make sure they exist. Then we're going to write this next query. So this one um, is for the country. So we're going to go, uh, for each country we've got a confederation. So go and look up the confederation, create the country, and connect them together. Uh, then we need to do our refactoring. A nice thing we can do here is we can do all of this in one query. So we can go and find the club, um, find the country, put, put a link between the club and the country, and get rid of the old country property. Um, same with the relational one. Maybe we choose to not remove that property until later, uh, but if we want to, we could do it all in one uh, one go. Uh, and then we'll do exactly the same thing for the players. So just uh, all the changes is we've got players and nationalities instead of clubs and countries. Uh, and if we go back, we can see well, what, how do our queries change. So remember, this was the query that we wrote for finding uh, players transferred between English clubs uh, who were English themselves. Um, we could now rewrite this query uh, now that we've got uh, uh, country separately, uh, and it would look like this. So you can see it gets a little, it gets a bit more verbose because uh, we've got an extra table that we need to join things into, or an extra uh, node type that we need to connect to. Uh, and so this is what we've added in. So we've got some extra joins on the countries. Let's go and find the, the country that the players from, the country that the, uh, clubs are representing. Uh, and we've got the same thing in the uh, in the, the cipher version down the, the bottom slide of the slide. Uh, interesting difference hope, uh, that you can see on the where clause is that 
in the uh, Cypher version, we don't need to go and specify the, the country lots of times. Um, so we can just hook, we can just find the node, in this case England, and we can just reuse that variable everywhere. So you notice that we're saying a player plays for a country, uh, England, uh, that country uh, is also used here, exactly the same, so even though it's in two places, it's the same same node, uh, and we're saying to is part of that, so what's to? Uh, oh, that's the to club, uh, and from, uh, what's from? That's the part, of, that's the uh, from club, so we've, all of them are just connecting into this same node, and we only have to say one time what it, that node actually is, uh, which is quite nice. Um, but we can, uh, what we can do now that we've got these confederations is uh, go and find transfers between them. Let's see what that would look like then. Uh, so what we're doing here is we're finding all the transfers uh, from the AFC confederation, so uh, I think that one is uh, Australasia, if I remember correctly, uh, to UEFA, which is the European one. So finding all the players uh, who transferred from that side of the world to, uh, to, to, to Europe. Uh, and this is what we've added in. So the other, this is the, this, these are the new bits of the query. So we're uh, we're now doing so we're we're, find, we're adding in the from country and the to country, uh, and we're also adding in the from confederation and the to confederation. In Cipher, we, there's quite a neat trick that you can do when you have uh, relationships of the same type. Um, so notice here that we've got this part of relationship, and then we've got a star two next to it. So this is a bit different than what we've done in any of our other queries. Um, and what Cypher allows you to do is, if you, if you know that you've got a relationship with the same name, you can say, well, how, how many hops do you want me to follow? Uh, and a hop uh, is, so for example, if we have um, a transfer was to a club, that would be one hop. If we have uh, a transfer is to a club and then a to a club goes somewhere else, that would be, then going all that way would be two hops. In this case, uh, we've, we've got, we're going from a from, so from is a club, and a, remember, a club is a part of a country, and a country is part of a confederation. Uh, and so we can actually simplify that by just putting our star two in here. So we're saying, well, from the from club to a node of label confederation with the ID AFC, there's going to be two part of relationships. And so we can um, we can simplify it. We can also simplify that query. We can just say uh, there's going to be two relationships, uh, and for where we're going to end up eventually is we're going to end up with AFC, and we're going to end up with UEFA. Uh, and in this case, we're just using it. It's a very, obviously, a very mini hierarchy of, of uh, clubs and countries and federations. Uh, but you can imagine using this for an organisational structure. So imagine you've got like an organisational structure showing how people report within a com within a, a company. We could go, okay, find the, the way from me all the way up to the CEO. How, like go and find that reporting structure. So report star, uh, and then finish off with the CEO. How far how far how far away on the reporting structure am I from the CEO, for example? And if we run that query, then it will go and find uh, find us all the all those transfers. Uh, and even though we're we're, now, we're starting from very disparate parts of the graph, so we're starting from uh, two confederations which are probably not linked in any way directly. Uh, they, 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 it's very very quick to go and work out uh, which transfers uh, connect those two confederations together. Uh, so hopefully that's covered that's covered a reasonable number of different queries. So we've we started up with some data, we loaded it in, and the two. Uh, Formats. We've uh, we've mod we've done some modelling. We've evolved the the the, the, uh, the data in uh, two different ways. So the first way we added in uh, just a new property, and the second one we've added in a new table, and then we've got had to go and restructure our existing tables. Um, so that's that's the end of our querying uh, sections. If you have any other queries that you think would be interesting, then uh, let us know in the questions, and uh, maybe I can I can answer that later. Uh, but the, the last thing that people are, are really curious about when they're uh, when they're comparing is uh, Relation, their knowledge of relational databases to graph databases is how do I, is how do I actually know what's in my database? Um, so I'm using Postgres uh, as the relational example, and uh, first question might be, okay, show me the tables. And so there's a command in there, uh, backslash dt, and we can run that, and it will say, yeah, you've got clubs, confederations, countries, players, and transfers, uh, and the owner is Mark. Um, in uh, Neo4j, in the Neo4j browser, which you get when you uh, when you start the database up. Uh, you can see node labels, those would be the equivalent, uh, and they'll show up in the top uh, left-hand side of your screen. Uh, but you can also work out what they are uh, programmatically as well. So uh, Neo4j 3.0 introduced uh, procedures, uh, and there's a procedure called labels, DB, la DB labels, and we can go and find out what labels have we got in our database. Um, another thing we might do is tell me what the schema looks like. So imagine we want to find out the schema of countries, 
Uh, we could use minus uh, backslash d plus countries, and it will tell us the schema of that. And you can see it comes up with columns, the types, indexes, foreign key constraints. Uh, in the graph, remember our schema, we've got, uh, we've got indexes, so we could uh, call a procedure to find the indexes. And then we could do the same to find constraints. So, these, so those would be indexes, and we've got some constraints uh, as well. Uh, we could also, you could also figure out like some sort of schema just by writing like a cipher query yourself. So for example, <coughs> we might want to go and see what keys have we got. So what, what properties are on country nodes? And we could run that query and it says, oh, well, all of them have got an ID and a name. So that's not that interesting. Uh, but if we run it on clubs, uh, it's actually a little bit different. So we've got 806 um, clubs have got ID and name, but there's uh, one solitary club which still has the country, so it obviously we didn't delete it. Um, uh, and so we'll look into why did that why did that happen? And it was there was some some, some weirdness with the data, which we'll, which we'll have a look at. Uh, next thing people think is, well, can I see like a, an entity relationship diagram? So in, it's really easy to do that uh, in Postgres. There's a, there's a tool I downloaded, and, and it will show me, hey, look, this is uh, what your database looks like. Uh, we've now got a, a procedure in, uh, in the FJ. I think this is from the 3.1 uh, version, which was released in December. So if you download uh, from the FJ.com forward slash download, this is the version that you'll get. So you, if, you, if you create your data and you're like, oh, I forgot what I put in there, call db.schema and you'll see that. Uh, and you can see that it's, it's telling us what the structure of our data is. So we've got player, place for a country, uh, transfer is off a player, transfer has two relationships to the club. Uh, to club and from club, and then there's various part of relationships as well. Um, what about data integrity? How do we how do we do that? Uh, pretty similar to how we um, do it in in SQL land. So uh, one thing we might want to do after we've done uh, our, uh, our migration or refactoring would be well, did it work, or were there, or were there some uh, some of the, some changes that didn't work? So this was my first attempt at uh, introducing a country ID. And you can see it didn't work for South Korea, um, Cote d'Ivoire, and, and the anomaly is uh, here is Monaco. Uh, the reason it didn't work for South Korea and, and, and the Ivory Coast uh, is because they had different names. So they, they, there's different ways you can, you can name those countries. And there were two data sources, and they used different names. Uh, with Monaco, it's an interesting one, because uh, the, the, uh, in, the, in my country's database, there is only France. France would be the, the, the country that they would consider Monaco in, uh, but in the original data set, Monaco, the, the club AS Monaco plays in Monaco. Uh, we can do the same thing in, uh, in the graphs as well. So we can write a query and say, hey, go and find me the clubs where they don't have a part of relationship, which would mean that the refactoring didn't work. Uh, and finally, deleting data. So in a SQL database, if you try and delete a table that still has some uh, some foreign key relationships, it will stop you. Um, and you and, and you can see from the hint, we need to use a, a drop cascade to sort things out. Uh, it's exactly the same uh, in Neo4j land. So if I try and if I decide I don't want countries anymore, I'm going to go and delete those. Uh, it will tell you no, you can't do that. Still got some relationships attached. Uh, and there's an equivalent uh, statement to work to help you out of that. So it's called, uh, called detach delete. Uh, and I've reached, I've reached my final slide. So just to, just to summarize what we've talked about in the last uh, 45 minutes or so. Uh, so we've introduced uh, some, new, some, some new terminology. So, so, so graphs have nodes, relationships, uh, properties, and labels. Uh, and those are reasonably similar to the, to the rows that we're used to in a relational database. And then our, our joins uh, and fields uh, and table names. Uh, low TSV is probably the best place to start. So if you've got a relational database that you want to put into a graph, or you've just got a dump of some CSV data, or maybe perhaps from a Hadoop uh, dump, uh, low TSV is a really nice way for do building a prototype or, or working with a smaller data set. Uh, once you start using graphs, remember there's no constraints by default, so you can, it will let you, it gives you the freedom to do whatever you like. Uh, so you've got to go and create those constraints. Uh, but the schema forms as, as we import our data. So as we make changes to the graph, as we import data, the schema is, uh, is forming. Uh, and hopefully you'll agree um, that the model is quite easy to evolve uh, and refactor. So we, 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 we found that like, we loaded an initial data set, and we decided we wanted to change it. And it wasn't really very difficult to, to actually do that. And that's uh, what we found with, uh, with a, lot of the, a lot of the users of Neo4j. Uh, they, they sort of have a very similar experience to, to hopefully to what I've uh, demonstrated. Um, so I'm going to hand back to Cody. Thanks so much for joining us, and thank you, Mark, for today's presentation.